you everyone to being here and uh, in so many of you here and so today we are going to talk about virtual reality I hope you know that that you saw in, uh, the plan and we won't go too into the into details because virtuality is really a broad uh, broad topic we'll talk like about some common uh, challenges that you you come through when you designing uh, when you design some kind of games uh, and uh, those kind of challenges are challenges that you will find on games uh, and on everything that you are going to design even for architecture and marketing that's briefly what I'm going to talk about so people are coming here briefly just my introduction me Mosca Fabio and uh, I'm a CTO at another reality I worked on, uh, been working on virtual reality for three years, more or less. I'm a programmer and game designer. I have four years, some, something like that, of experience on game designing. And uh, first time I tried the Oculus Rift, the first DK1, I spent 35 minutes on the roller coasters and uh, I didn't have any kind of motion sickness and they thought that uh, that was a go good plus to me to start to start to work on virtual reality and they happen then to open a company. That's about me, but first, about you, everyone here listening here. Who is working right now on something uh, related to virtual reality? Raise your hands. All right. And they know you, the people working there. And anyone here, okay. Almost nobody, if you, uh, no one of you is working on virtual reality. How many of you is familiar with uh, game engines like Unity or Unreal Engine, raise your hands. Okay, so it's roughly 30%, 40% of people. And why am asking the, why asking this? Because uh, for everyone that would like to start to work on virtual reality, generally talking about uh, like Samsung Gear or Oculus or ATC Vive or every kind of headset, uh, you work with game engines. So the the engines that you make video games are the best tools to work uh, and to create virtual reality experiences. So you use uh, uh, programming languages like C Sharp or C++ and uh, they let you create stuff uh, in two dimensions. You have to work on both on code and on, uh, and on graphics. Summarizing, what we are going to talk about today seated, seated VR, so the, the kind of virtual reality that you play being sit at a desk without moving. Why? Because uh, there are various kinds of virtual reality experiences that like you can work around and we'll go that into that uh, later. But to talk, to cover all those kinds of experiences probably will take two hours or three hours. Or so let's keep it short for today. And on, part on particular, for the seated war, since you are not moving, we'll go into the deeper about the motion sickness, just to understand what is it and uh, why it gives these problems. Then, I bring uh, my experience on a video game that uh, we worked uh, working on last year and this year. That's called Young Paradox, and uh, from this one, we'll uh, we'll analyze how to support virtual reality and uh, normal desktop PC. What are the challenges, the choices that you go through designing uh, virtual reality experiences and what, what you, like the kind of workarounds that you need to, to go into that, like performance issues. And uh, I will bring some examples of problems, solutions that uh, we applied and the results on, of those solutions. Because uh, since virtual reality is kind of novel, is really novel, there aren't, there still aren't uh, standard procedures. So you go through experimenting. There are some stuff that is uh, set in stone, but really lit, uh, not much. And most of the stuff that uh, you try, you have to test on people and analyze the, resu the results afterwards. And then summarizing the takeaway of this talk. So, seated voir. We can divide seated voir like in two or let's say two, two kinds of experiences. 
like the fixed position, like you can see here, like you're playing here in virtual reality. The only thing you have to do here is turn around with your head and everything happens around you. So th there isn't any kind of movement. So you are sitting here and uh, inside the experience, you are sitting there. Generally, actions are made through the gaze. So you point and you interact with something like here, something like a touchpad or with a controller, for instance. You can have, have also hands controller to pick objects and to select. So the only limitations for this one about sickness or like human performance, let's say, is your head. Like turning uh, 180 degrees is not really comfortable for a human. Maybe good for a whole, but no yet virtual reality for holes. And uh, placing objects really too high and you need hands to reach them, uh, you will see people uh, getting uh, tired uh, like every, like after two minutes. It's incredible how lazy we are. Then there are the kind of experiences where you're sitting, but you move inside of the game, like this one. The difference here is that uh, you can have like constant movement or you can control your movement through some joystick controllers or uh, just pressing to, to walk around. And this is the one that we are going to talk about because that's the most complicated because you go through simulator sickness. Also, even if you are not uh, in the first person but in third person, so like you have uh, um, some objects, a car or a character that is moving, you're still following him with a movement. So every movement that you do inside uh, while you are sitting, not moving, somehow is going to trigger motion sickness. Then there are the room scale experiences, like those kind of experiences that maybe some of you saw back down in the, in the, in the ground floor, where you actually move around, you work with your legs, you pick objects, and as long as, as, long as you have space, uh, it's fine. But I'm not going uh, into uh, to talk about them because there's a talk tomorrow about those from uh, Edge Guardian. So advising you if you are interested also in these kind of experiences to come here tomorrow, same hour. Simulator sickness, the myth of simulator sickness. Everyone is talking about simulator sickness. I tried Oculus Rift and roller coaster and I, po I poke it for one hour. Good. Why? Let's uh, understand why. Because to know your enemy, you must become your enemy. The famous Sun Tzu, famous expert of virtual reality at the times. And uh, what's, what's the problem here? Like human specification, we like specification as a programmer, usually, right? How we understand uh, how we are moving uh, through our eyes, visual, visual clues, through the vestibular system, so like you have uh, this kind of system into your ears that understand accelerations that even if you, are, if you have your eyes closed but you are on a roller coaster, you will feel that you are moving quite. And uh, of course body sensation, like you feel with your feet that you are touching the ground and you are like, moving forward. Normally, like every day, those three systems agree. Like if I see myself moving forward, my ears feel that I'm moving forward. That's how it works and it's perfectly good. What's the problem? The problem is that like you have car sickness, like virtual reality sickness, simulator sickness, or plenty of names about this kind of sickness. Since you are sitting down, not moving, but you see something moving, your sensors, those three sensors specificated before does not do not matches. So not matching uh, for our evolutionary system that is still bounded to the stone age for uh, like human body, like technology advances like every year, new specification. Humans takes a thousand years to evolve. And the problem is that our body thinks that we have been poisoned because we eaten some mushrooms, some, something uh, really dangerous. And the natural reaction, reaction is to like sweet, puke, and uh, that's where nausea comes in. If you happen to try virtual reality and you start to feel sickness, nausea, it's not going to disappear magically while you are playing. Uh, it's best to just stop for a while, rest, and then come back. So until you, we are not, until those are not in the market, 
and uh, those have been announced uh, like three years ago and uh, they are still not ready. We need to work around the, uh, those, are those human specifications. Uh, we need to use some tricks. What kind of tricks? Electric signals to your ears, for instance. Maybe not. I don't know if you want to fry your ears yet and uh, those uh, headphones are not out in the market. They are just uh, some kind of research. So we work uh, like on the design, on the, appli the, applica the application design and like the code. How? Let's see what I did, uh, what my team did last year and see what worked and what not. Young Paradox. That's the game. That's it. No kidding. Is uh, this kind of graphics is a puzzle game where like you have to solve puzzles because there's a broken time machine and uh, since the time machine is broken every two minutes this time machine creates a clone of yourself and this clone will go around making uh, all the actions that you did before and if you happen to be seen from your past clone you die because you create a paradox so you need to play do your kind of actions and solve the puzzles and at the same time you play a stealth game of not be not like to avoiding uh, your past self that is playing on uh, your like a ghost uh, so it's really based uh, on uh, going through places uh, because uh, that's where uh, like the challenge happens that's what you happen when it happens when a clone sees you like you die clone sees you, becomes red, and uh, the, the screen flickers. Young Party is a game that uh, uh, has been designed for virtual reality, but it also works on PC. And we were testing it on a, for who's familiar with this kind of uh, hardware, a uh, Radeon 7850, which is pretty old, and uh, we managed to make, it, uh, make the game run on that old graphic card. And we'll see later what's about that. Why supporting a game for virtual reality and for PC too? I don't know if you see down there those numbers. This is 140,000. This is 70,000. And this is PlayStation War, 200 more thousand. So the, the market of virtual reality, like one month ago, was, let's say, between uh, 150,000 and 200,000 users, which, which may seem pretty good, but if you compare it with the normal gaming uh, community on Steam, for instance, which is uh, 130 million, so that's kind of nothing. So if you are going to design and to, like, to work on a video game f made only for virtual reality, what happens is that uh, you spend more time, more energy, more resources to sell pretty much le a lot of uh, less copies because uh, your target audience is really, really small right now. So, of course, in, uh, in a market perspective, uh, working, having a game that works both on virtual reality and on PC, pretty good. Then, gameplay designing. To design a video game that supports both means that uh, the game must be good on both the experiences. And uh, luckily, since the, the virtual reality experience is usually the one that needs, has more limitations, usually if you design it well for virtual reality, it's going to work pretty well also on PC. And uh, in the end, what the supporting both VR and PC means that you need to do a lot of testing on both versions and uh, going around to exhibitions uh, and make the, game, make the game run on virtual reality means that you have to go around with pretty expensive or big computers and uh, all the headsets. So it may, can be keep your day busy. This is the kind of testing that you may happen to, to do in virtual reality because like you can grab an object that you put in your face. That's something that uh, it happens on PC games, but it shouldn't. On top of that, let's see. Design choices. What was the first problem that you are going to have on uh, virtual reality? Performance. Because you need 90 frames per second for the 2K resolution constant. You, can, you, you are not allowed 
to have a frame drops. And since usually PC experiences uh, runs at uh, 60 frames per second, sometimes even less, that's, that's a huge problem, the performance problem. How we, how we went through this, problem, uh, through this problem? We choose a graphic style which is really light, really light, because it has no light, actually, and every light you put on a, on a game engine, it increases the, the weight, the, the performance cost. Two lights is the double, usually, if they are in the same place. No light, pretty good. No texture, almost no textures. Even if you see colors here and stuff, those are not textures, are what are called uh, shaders, materials. And just to say, all the game is uh, 130 megabytes on Steam. It's, it's a virtual reality game also. So what we did is cutting off the, all those kind of stuff and working only on shaders to keep the graphic as like as possible. We started from Tron, because Tron in the, in the, in the 80s uh, pretty much uh, understood this kind of graphics and seems that worked uh, pretty well. So we thought uh, if, they, if that graphics were, were worked well, should work well also for us, right? And we went from this to this. And this is lighter than this one. Take less performance, this one. So our graphics became pretty much close to anti-chamber for who knows anti the, the anti-chamber game. But luckily for us, uh, it was uh, inverted. Why? We thought that going through, through darker colors is better for your eyes because like, if you look at the sun or some, uh, <laughs> for too much time or, or to a white screen, a completely white screen, like, this is a strong light. Now imagine having uh, this one uh, with like, a white screen uh, one centimeter to your eyes. I play it after like, 30 minutes, you are going to have some tears going down. So it's better to keep the, um, the color darks. It's not really a huge problem, but you know, it's a bonus to make the player play longer. The play, players, player plays longer, player satisfied more. Good reviews for you. Results on this one. The aesthetic choices from a constraint became like um, a strong point of our game because uh, going through this kind of design um, put us in this kind of challenge that uh, ended up uh, in, a particular, let's say in a particular style that no one had before beside anti-chamber but in the, in the different colors. And also since the graphic like reminds of, uh, of Tron, we had plenty of players that playing the game uh, without the headset uh, and without knowing uh, if the game, the, the game was for war, they came out asking me like, is this game uh, for uh, virtual reality too? Because I think it would be, be nice. It seems made of war. And I was like, yes, yes, it's made for war. Like, thank you. All right, second problem, locomotion sickness, right? I talked about it before. That's a huge problem. Because the game was designed to be in uh, sit, to be played at the PC with, uh, without requiring people to have a large, large place to room. And uh, I couldn't use uh, what is called the teleport system, which is a pretty common uh, uh, standard in virtual reality right now to move. Because since you teleport, your body doesn't feel uh, moving, so you avoid to have sickness. But since uh, our design was based on clones that works around as you did before and uh, you can uh, happen to meet them and that's where the challenge, the gameplay comes, we couldn't use teleport. We needed people to control as a first person game and to, to work around with the controls. Solution that we, we applied, which, which uh, is nothing uh, really new, is something that you can find uh, on uh, plenty of guides from uh, even from Oculus uh, Rift uh, for Unity. There are, let's say, the best practices. 
is to avoid acceleration and use uh, constant speed. And the more the speed matches uh, the human speed, the better is it. And we used uh, a system uh, to turn your head that you can go into deeper later. And uh, since every kind of vertical movement uh, helps you to feel more sick, or even this kind of movement like rotating, uh, tilting uh, the player inside the game brings a lot of sickness. We started to design the game uh, thinking about uh, we are not going to need any of these. So no kind of jumps, anything, uh, just plain. More into the deep. I told you before, we use a particular system to, um, to turn around. Let's see if the, the audio works, maybe. Okay, that, that was supposed to have the audio, but luckily it has not. And how it works, this kind of system. You press a button and you find yourself like teleported and turned by 30 degrees, like almost instantly. This may feel not natural at first, but what happens to our body is that our body is brought into thinking that he has like just blinked and found himself turned by 30 degrees. So while uh, sometimes can give some disorientation at first, uh, it doesn't trigger sickness because uh, if you use a normal stick to gradually rotate and your head is not rotating actually, that's a major uh, problem for sickness, like sickness there comes uh, pretty, pretty, pretty fast. So pressing uh, just a, a button helps you to turn. Pressing uh, the button like three or four times it turns you to 100, uh, 180 degrees, solving the problem of uh, our head is not the whole head. And it came out, player understood pretty, pretty good this kind of system. Then, constant movement speed without any kind of acceleration. If you, like, if you saw the example before of the game, uh, like going around and flying, they have a constant movement speed. Since uh, the vestibular system that they talked before understands only acceleration, you can also go, you can, mm -hmm. you can go around uh, with going at uh, 100 kilometers uh, per second. But if that speed is constant, it's fine. Problem is, is when you break, or you accelerate too much. Is it good? Hopefully it's not going to trigger most of sickness to you, this one. So bear with it, please. <laughs> not, I swear, not my computer and anything fall here. So level design tailor-made. What means that since uh, the less vertical movement, the less acceleration you have, the, be the better it is. We avoided to design a game that needs you to jump, that needs you to, like, to have uphills and uh, to crouch or to do everything. So like, only one level, like only the ground floor, constant, everywhere. And to do that uh, means that you, have, uh, you can rely on um, assets that you buy around uh, as you needed to do it yourself. Results, pretty bad. What do you mean pretty bad? In expositions, in uh, all the demos that we had, usually like on, uh, on average, on average of 100 people, five of them came out like uh, stopping before, seeing like, no, I, I feel kind of sick, maybe it's my first time, yeah. But the most of them were pretty fine, I, even after, uh, after 15 minutes of playing. The bad thing is that when you go online, when you go selling uh, your game, people leave you reviews when they are angry to you. So out of those people, like, we have some bad, uh, bad reviews because uh, like, people felt sick. But we don't have good reviews because people weren't feeling sick, because if people are fine, they won't write it. Oh, very good, uh, I played the game, it's fine. But when they feel sick, they come immediately to write a wall of text saying that uh, they couldn't go to work the, uh, the day after or stuff like that. So keep this in mind. 
when designing these kind of experiences that requires movement, let's see if there is something else, no, okay. When designing these kind of experiences, think about if you go online to tell the people a lot that some of them, they are going to have some kind of sickness, maybe even give them some choices, like uh, you can have teleport or uh, know what you are going through. Maybe you are going to avoid some bad reviews. Maybe. So pro another problem, user interface. A probably user interface is uh, completely another talk if we are going too deep in that. So to stay light and uh, summarize it, where, you sh where you are going to show information uh, to people playing virtual reality? Since, since virtual reality is uh, like exactly your reality, you don't have a monitor or something uh, as a reference where you can say, okay, I put uh, this number on the top left corner because you don't have a top left corner. Think in your real life, where is your top left corner? Like you turn around and you'll see to find this kind, of, this kind of corner. But you still need to show them some data. In our game, for instance, we needed to show them uh, how many seconds were, uh, were left before a time jump. But I can't print a label in front of them, following them forever, because it doesn't feel really natural, not really good. Solution is what is called the diegetic user interface, which is like this one. And we made all the menus as a 3D content. All right, what is diegetic user interface? For, for who doesn't know it, diegetic is the kind of user interface that is integrated into your world. So, in your world right now, this one is a diegetic interface. I, I, I look through this and I see some information here. That's diegetic. In, ga in video games or in every kind of application, if you show like, uh, how do you show the, what time is it? You can show like here, like this. Imagine this is a window, this is a screen. Or you can show a watch there with the time. That's diegetic. And if you do that into the game, it's pretty good. It's uh, understandable. What we did is to place those hour glasses through all the levels. So player just walk around and uh, he looks at the various hour glasses understand that there's a time, there are glasses moving, the sand is uh, falling down, and that's a countdown of the time. It's understandable and is integrated into the world, so it's more immersive. Menus. You have to show like pose menu or the, the standard menu. You can choose to have like normal textures, should be like, icons, images and stuff which is acceptable, it works. Or you can like go further and create everything in three, in three dimensions with 3D modeling. Why? Because it means that if you have this kind of menu and you lean forward, like you can actually look at the back of the menu. So it's, it feels really good. It feels really that everything has been taught and it works for virtual reality. Did it work? Well, except for those ones, which are not 3D dimensions. At least they seem not, not three dimensions, so people weren't under, uh, usually people do not understand that they need to step into those places to make stuff happen in the game. Usually it worked well. No one uh, wondered uh, actually wha what the hourglasses uh, were or at least they understood immediately that the hourglasses mean something that, that was a countdown and when the countdown comes to zero, they need to stay alert without any kind of explanation. And also, this kind of user interface works good, very good, also on normal PC, on normal desk, because when you are playing here, you just see the, the objects around and it's the same, you do the work pretty much take away of all these kind of explanation. That's the takeaway, right? So what are your uh, meatballs of today? 
virtual reality in games force you to find workarounds for performance. So, since you have to do that, try to think about uh, how to make it a strong point. There is a video game which is called uh, Budget Cuts, and uh, if, as I said before, like teleport uh, is a is a really pro is a problem. Like is a workaround. It breaks your immersion. Like you teleport, you just click to go around, to go around. They made it uh, something uh, as a strong point uh, where you can actually tell, since it's a stealth game uh, where you have to throw knives uh, to robots. Uh, you can like throw something uh, like a ball that is going to teleport, but before teleporting, you can see the point of view of that ball like inside, uh, let's say, a sphere. So it becomes a uh, game mechanics, and pretty good job. Second, I won't say make a game uh, in a room scale because it's like in a room scale uh, where your body is moving, you are not going to suffer any kind of motion sickness and, and stuff because your body is moving, you see the movement, you don't have problems there. But if you're going to make like a game on this one where people cannot move because uh, this kind of headset doesn't understand when you are moving forward or backward, you have to, you, you already know that some people, even uh, if you make uh, like a year of, uh, of work on an effort to reduce sickness, uh, there are still someone that is particular, uh, like susceptible to motion sickness. And when you go online, those people will come to you and give you bad reviews. So since uh, selling a game uh, on, um, on the market is Having good reviews, a good percentage of, uh, of good reviews is really important. Keep this in mind. How can you mitigate that? Well, maybe give them some choices of movement, which is something that uh, we, didn't, we didn't do, mostly because we didn't have time. And because we didn't talk about it before, we thought like we are going to use this kind of, uh, of movement, which was uh, really accepted before for uh, people like me or people that were using uh, virtual reality it was okay some to be sick the first time because you need to get used to it but the common like common people wants to try it and the first time they try the headset and uh, they feel sick they will tell oh this is not uh, not good i'm not going to try virtual reality ever because i felt sick you don't want that And at least if you can't give them choices, or even if you give them, if you have these kind of experiences moving, uh, tell them that maybe it's going to trigger some kind of sickness, or be aware of that. Uh, be aware that you can, you can train yourself on that, and if you keep going, keep going, uh, that's going to be, is going to be gone, the, the sickness. You get used to it until it's not, uh, it's not so bad. And as I said before, I, why then developing a vi video games for virtual reality? There isn't a, a real market, takes a lot of practice, takes more resources and a uh, lot of problems and bad reviews, uh, sometimes good, of course. Because when you, when you work on a game, you have seen everything, every kind of user, every kind of experiences, uh, all the constraints that you have because you need to design the environment, uh, you need to keep in mind the user, all the, all the limitations, and, you need, and that needs to be fun. And if you do that, the next day you have to do an architecture, uh, uh, virtual reality representation, which doesn't need, doesn't need to be fun. But all of that I, uh, that I talked before is going to be useful. And you already had these experiences working on a game. And also, because uh, in this moment, there is a big blooming of the market of virtual reality arcades. So the user base of people having a headset at home is pretty low because, well, price. Um, big headset is uh, a bit less than you can understand, and then you need a uh, hundred and more, a uh, thousand more uh, euros for, of computer. 
But if you people go to those places, pay five euros, 10 euros, they are willing to play virtual reality. This is a big market that is starting now. So making games now at least to experience it may turn a good deal for the future to work on, uh, on arcade games. Now, hope, hopefully, this talk helped you someone in, to start to study like Unity and Unreal and make some uh, virtual reality games. And this was a photo, uh, photo of the actual international community of virtual reality like developers. It was a conference a uh, few, few weeks ago. And I expected to see maybe some of you in the next year here or with some virtual reality stuff. So that's it. Thank you. Well, since we have like five minutes, right? Three, uh, four, four minutes. Let's see that we have some time for questions. If anyone is interested, yeah. You mean on my particular case of the game? There are, since uh, the game uh, was uh, initially taught for virtual reality, there are some kind of puzzles that make use of your depth perception. There are like a really simple puzzle like where you have just to pick an object and place it on the top of a table. But doing in virtual reality means that you can grab the object and you lean forward and uh, you place it perfectly. And uh, PC version uh, usually is, uh, you don't have this kind of depth perception. You need to move more to find yourself comfortable there. The, mm, so I would say that people in virtual reality solve the puzzles faster. The pro on the other side, the people that are a lot of, uh, they have uh, a lot of experience to, to play video games, uh, they are really faster on PC because uh, if they are super comfortable, uh, they are skilled player, they move pretty fast. Uh, on in this side, uh, they go, they do faster puzzle on, uh, on the desktop PC. And w another thing that I noticed that uh, the more the player that is using virtual reality is a gamer, the less is going to, uh, to exploit the virtual reality. And uh, what I mean is that they prefer, they, they will keep the head straight and they just walk around and press all the buttons without moving. People who are not experienced with games, uh, they move a lot of the head and they act more natural. So they are more prone to use virtual reality for what virtual reality has been taught of. Yeah. Um, you can't drop below 90 frames per second, mostly because if you drop it, like you, you will see, like, or at least you will feel the change of frame per second, and that's going to trigger more sickness. Maybe not immediately, but if you have a lot of drops, uh, that's going to be like not good. For the, for the player. So the target and for a virtual reality is to keep the frames as stable as possible and uh, 90, 90 frames per second. Okay? Next, anyone else? We have still one minute, so we can have uh, one question or maybe one. One question more, one question more. Or you just gain the one minute, so. Question, three, two, one, okay. Everyone is free now. <laughs>